text for our message this morning comes to us from Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, our Old Testament reading. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, exclaimed Dorothy Gale as she finally got the courage to step out of her house in the land of Oz as it sat atop the Wicked Witch of the East. I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, know exactly that this line came from The Wizard of Oz, either the play or the movie, both are the same there. And so you know probably the story as it goes. As Dorothy seeks to find her way back to Kansas, she travels along and she comes across some various things that she hasn't seen before. Sights that she hasn't before come across, in particular, three individuals who she may not have normally run into, a brainless scarecrow, a heartless tin woodsman, and a cowardly lion. So with Toto in tow, they travel along. And as you know, they eventually come to the Wizard of Oz, to his palace, as it is of great grandeur. But we find out that the wizard is a fraud. But that's okay, right? Because if you've seen the Wizard of Oz, you know, know what happens next. Next, they, we find out that all along, it was inside of them. They had the strength inside of them. Dorothy, she could just tap her heels together three times to go home. The scarecrow, well, he could wallow away those hours conferring with the flowers and consulting with the trees. The tin woodsman, as he cried, showed his true emotion, and the cowardly lion stood up for what was true and right when he had to. Seems like a great story. But not such a good description of life, is it? Because we know that it, as much as we try, there, there, we can't find such ideal situations. We know that as hard as we try, we, we, we can't always fix those things in our lives that aren't perfect, can we? We know that, uh, there, that we might try to, and there's been hundreds and thousands of self-help books written. Just go to your library or to the bookstore, and you'll see self-help books on everything from to quit smoking, to lose weight, to how to have a happy, fulfilled life, how to better save everything. But we know that oftentimes, even with these self-help books, people fail. And when we fail, we don't like to take that burden ourselves, do we? We, we don't like to be the ones that fall. Instead, we prefer to pass the buck. We prefer to put the blame on someone else so that we don't have to bear it. This reminds me of a story, a true story, of when I was in first grade. Now, some of you have heard this story before, so bear with me a moment. But it's a story of uh, when I was, my friend Tommy Simpson and I were in first grade. And our teacher, Mrs. Volk, she had to be away from school one day. And I don't know the reason why any longer. But we had a substitute teacher. My best friend Tommy and I thought, well, this is the perfect time to use our ultra-sharp safety scissors as swords. And so we were swashbuckling as just the best of them would, when suddenly the substitute teacher came over to us, and he leaned in, and he said, gentlemen, we use our ultra-sharp safety scissors to cut out art projects, not for swords. Well, that wasn't the bad part. Because we went back to the day as it went and went back to everything we had to do. But the next morning, Mrs. Volk came in. And she called me to her desk. And I imagine she called Tommy to her desk a little after myself. And she said quietly, Jonathan, what were you doing? You know better than to use your ultra-sharp safety scissors as a sword. And I looked at Mrs. Volk and I swallowed and I said, in the same sturdiness and same tone, without skipping a beat, the devil made me do it. And she looked at me, and I wasn't sure if she was going to laugh or explode, but said, no, Jonathan, the devil did not make you do it. You are responsible for your own actions. True story. I've since learned that it is very true that I am responsible for my own actions. But too often we do like to pass the blame, don't we? We like to pass the buck onto someone else. We don't like to hold the responsibility. We like to either say, well, so-and-so made me do it, and because it takes it out of our hands. It vindicates us in a way, because then at least we're not touching it. We, we can say, I couldn't help myself. And isn't that exactly what was going on in Ezekiel's message to the people of Israel here? Here the people of Israel have this proverb that they couldn't help but say, and you may not have recognized this proverb yourself because we don't use it, but they said, the fathers have eaten the sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Well, that, if you didn't catch what the meaning is there, is basically 
the children of Israel are complaining because they are getting punished for what the forefathers did. They are complaining because they don't feel responsible for what has happened. They don't think that their sin has counted. They think that the Babylonian exile, that's the fault of our parents. The, the fact that there are, are armies surrounding them, that there are other forces, that's the fault of their forefathers. And they refuse to take responsibility for their own sin. They refuse to take an honest look at themselves and say, wait a second here. Could there be some truth to this? No, in fact, actually, they don't do that, do they? They continue when they stop blaming their forefathers. If you read just a little further, who do they blame next? They blame God, don't they? They put the blame on God and say, God, it's your fault. You're unjust. Did you see the question God asked of them? Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? No, it's your way. But they can't help but pass that buck. Pass that blame on to someone else. And regrettably, we know exactly what this is like. Regrettably, we see this on a day-to-day basis. The other night, Carla and I were watching the primary debates and between all of the Republican candidates. And I noticed time and again a common theme. There was a little finger-pointing going on. We blame the current administration for all the problems we have. And it's not just in those debates. I I think if you turned on the TV for 10 minutes, you would see how many times it's this party's fault or that party's fault. The reason that we have a bad economy? Well, because of the fact that we didn't pass this bill in the House. The reason that we have a problem with with illegal aliens and we have a problem with foreign policy is because so-and-so vetoed this bill. And we see this time and again, this blame game. And it starts from the very beginning. All of us are familiar with Adam and Eve. And we know exactly, as they were called to account by God, how it started. God said, Adam, how did you know that you were naked? And Adam said, instead of saying, well, Lord, I ate of the fruit you gave me, points his finger. And he says, it's that woman you gave to me. It's her fault. And then Eve, oh, it's that serpent you gave me. It's his fault. And the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. But really, they were responsible for their own sins. And they knew it, as as we find out, as we read on. But it's not just a very laughing matter, is it? Because we know that a lot of times people pass this responsibility in their marriages, in their families, in their relationships with others. Employees blame their bosses for, for too much work when they maybe could have been more efficient with their time. Bosses blame their employees for for a low bottom line, a bottom line that doesn't measure up, and when it could have been invested, the money could be invested better. Spouses get angry at their husband or their wife because of the fact that they are too pig-headed. Children get angry at their parents because they refuse, because they feel they are not respecting them. Children get angry at their or parents get angry at their children when they don't perform well in school, and it's the school district's fault. And ultimately, these blames continue on from here, don't they? I'm sure whether or not you have ever said, the devil made me do it, that there have been things in your life that you have put the blame on someone else. You have passed the buck to someone else. And a lot of times, the Lord gets our blame. A lot of times, we, like the people of Israel, when things don't go our way, when we can't can't click together three times our ruby slippers, we pass that buck on to the Lord and we say, Lord, it is your fault that my marriage is falling apart. Lord, it is your fault that I do not get along with my children. Lord, it is your fault that I don't have the job that I deserve to have. Lord, it is your fault that my life is not going the way it should go. And so we like to blame, maybe not like, but prefer to blame God. Because he is all-powerful, isn't he? Shouldn't he fix everything? Well, I think the easy way out of this would be to say, well, we're just pointing the finger the wrong way. Instead, we should be pointing our finger to the devil and saying, devil, it is your fault. Devil, you are the one who has made me do this. You are the one who has caused these issues in my life. But isn't that passing the buck? again. Isn't that 
releasing responsibility once more. Blaming someone else. See, too often we do. We shift that blame. We pass that buck. And we feel as though we can get away with blaming it on God or blaming it on the devil. In reality, the truth is actually much more painful, isn't it? The truth, as painful as it is, though, is that you and me have wandered from God's path, have wandered from His perfect law. You and me have at times been the cause of our own difficulty, our own pain. Spouses who don't get along with their husband or their wife, sometimes it's because both of them are unwilling to let the other person have a word in edgewise. Children who don't get along with their parents, sometimes it's because they think that there's an authority that they, if they let go of, that the other will win the argument. Sometimes we have medical problems because we don't eat right, because we don't exercise right. Sometimes, let me take that back, all the time, we have problems in our spiritual lives because we wander from God. We are the responsible ones. We are the ones who, when we look down, it is not the devil who made, it do, made us do it. It is our own sinful nature. It is our own choices, the things that we have done in our lives that separated us from God. God has never left us. God has never wandered away from us, but we, time and again, have taken those roads that we thought were the easy way out and wandered far from Him. And so isn't the question that God asks of the Israelites quite appropriate for us? Are my ways unjust, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? O people of God, is it not your ways that are unjust? Is it not my ways that are unjust? And God offers us a solution to this problem, but it wouldn't be an easy solution. It's easy to say, but hard to do. And that is to repent. Repent and live are the words that close our Old Testament lesson for today in Ezekiel. But how hard is it for us to repent, to turn back? Merriam-Webster defines repentance as to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life to feel regret or contrition, and to change one's mind. The word here used in Hebrew, shuv, literally to turn back, as if on the way walking down the road, to turn around. And I've heard it def- described by pastors to me in the past. A 180 degree turn from our sinful lives. But how hard is it to do that? To make that 180 degree turn. How hard is it to turn back from our own sinful ways. Sure, at times we feel we're getting these things under control. We grab hold of one sin, but we discover there's 800,000 still waiting for us to figure out. And as often as we repent, as often as we turn back, we discover we are still sinful people. We are still people who at our very heart, our very nature, are separated from God, have wandered from Him. And so there is only one cure. There is only one cure to the soul that has turned from God for the Christian, for the believer who has who's left their Lord and wandered away. And that is our Savior Jesus. Our Savior Jesus, who did live a life that is perfect. Who did live a life that was without blemish. Who did live a life that was white as snow. He went to the cross for each one of us. Because on our own, we could not repent. On our own, we could not turn to God. But only by His power. Only by the power of His Holy Spirit within our lives could we see that true need we have for forgiveness of sin. And out of His great love for us, our Lord, He saw through our sinful natures. He saw through our broken bodies. And he said, you are mine. 
Only through Him could He create in us a true heart. Restore in us a free spirit. Only through our Savior. So often, so often we want it to be something that's under our control. So often we want it to be something that we could just click our heels together, find the inner strength to control, but it's not. But it's so much greater than that. Because on our power, of course, it would fail. But on the power of our Savior, it cannot fail. Of the power of Christ, we need not be afraid. We need not fear. Because He has claimed us as His own. He has covered us with His perfect blood to make us righteous. Now is this then license to live our lives never repenting, never never seeking God's law? No. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And that is the promise that God gives to us. That as we are redeemed children of God, as we do seek His repentance, as we do seek His forgiveness time and again, that time and again He will say to us, I forgive you. Time and again He will say to you, you are my child and I love you. And that promise that's made in our baptism, that promise that Peyton received today, is a promise that one day we will celebrate in the glory of the Father. We will be set free from the pains of this life, from the difficulties of this world, from the heart hurt and the pain, from the blame of this world. And we will see the glory of our Father. And He will say, welcome home. And with His love and grace, will call us home to Him. And as God calls us, repent and live. And live your life to the fullness. Live your life to the fullness in Christ as children who have received the forgiveness of our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are sinful people. We have sinned against you in our thought, word, and deed. But we know that as many times as we have sinned, you have called us back to yourself. You have sent your Holy Spirit to us, and we pray, Lord, that we would ever know this promise, that we would ever know your consolation and your forgiveness. And that we would know that because of your death on the cross, we do have salvation. Lord, we pray that each day we would joyfully celebrate this salvation. We would seek after your ways. And that we would share your gracious love with all those we meet. Lord, help us to see that it is not by our power, not by our might, but by your spirit. That we have been made your children. And that one day, we will receive our reward in heaven with you. May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard our hearts and minds now and always. Amen.